Hello, this is Dr. Robinson, and I want to welcome you to Chapter 3, where we're going to talk about connecting our assessment to instruction and talk about some of the essential components in this process. So basically, in a nutshell, we need to assess what is taught. And one of the things that they want you to understand in this first part about it is that you know, as a teacher, you are expected to understand and use data. We know that when we assess what is taught, when we have that connection of learning and our outcome, what we want our outcome to be, what our goals are, and when we assess that, we know that that gives us as reflective practitioners ideas about what our students need next. And so we understand that assessment and instruction go hand in hand and that we need to use data to understand what is going to be happening in our classrooms. And so that makes sense. We want to make sure that our outcomes are tied to what we're teaching. So one of the things that you need to be aware of, and if you haven't learned about this, you want to, um, make sure that you're fairly proficient with this because I just had a student student take the core test and tell me that there were questions about Bloom's on it. Um, so when we think about the Bloom's cognitive taxonomy, which I'm sure you've heard of, Benjamin Bloom came up with actually, I believe, four different taxonomies, and one of them was a cognitive, which talks about the hierarchy of skills. And if you notice, I have put a couple of pictures on this slide for you. Because for me, I'm a visual learner and I find that that helps. So I want you to think of Bloom's taxonomy as a ladder with remembering at the bottom of the ladder. And as we take our steps up the ladder, we're going higher in our taxonomy. And we want to go from having our students giving them questions that are based on remembering and understanding and getting into that evaluating, analyzing, creating skills, because that's where true learning takes place. So you're going to see me use this ladder as kind of a visual memory system for you. And we know that as we differentiate our instruction, we allow our students to do a different levels of understanding. And I want you to say as candidates for who are going to be teaching students with exceptionalities, often we fall into the trap of thinking that our students must be, must, how, what word do I want to use? Our students must become, have mastery at the lower levels. But that's not how we learn. Think about how scientists learn. Yes, you have to understand some facts, but you also get in there and you start trying to apply the information. You start playing with the information. And often what we're finding with a lot of evidence-based strategies, PBL, using some of the higher order thinking skills, is that when we give students, especially students with learning disabilities, opportunities to experience their learning instead of just memorize facts, they often have a deeper understanding. So when we think about these different skills, there's a lot of different ways that you can look them up on the internet and become proficient with them. But think about comprehension and understanding. That's basically remembering, being able to take it and directly apply it. When we get more into the application, we're being able to uh, use the knowledge that we've taken and find solutions to problems. When we get into analyzing, as your book will tell you, it requires you to separate that concept or the issue and put it into other parts of the problem. So you're taking it, you're able to look at it and say, this might fit here. I think of this more as putting the piece of the puzzle together. When we get into, now your book talks about synthesis and evaluation. When we think about evaluating, we get into that critical review. Think about if I were to tell you to evaluate two methods. Well, you're doing the pros, the cons, you're coming up with procedures, you're thinking, what would I use for that? But when we get into creating and using our information in a new manner, that's where we truly get into a higher order thinking skill and being able to come up with what we really want to know. So one of, the, one of the things that Anderson and Carthwell did is they took Bloom's work and they put it in 
to four dimensions of knowledge, factual, conceptual, procedural, and metacognitive. Factual is understanding facts. One plus one is two. Conceptual is understanding how something works, the concept. Do you understand the concept of multiplication, that it's repeated addition? Procedural is how do you do something. And metacognitive knowledge is that higher level. And that's where, think of metacognitive, you're getting into the strategies. It's that idea of your cognition, of your understanding of how you learn and how you apply that. That's on page 46 of your book, that if you want to look at that a little further in depth. This is also something um, that I copied into this PowerPoint for you because often when we think about the pyramid, we have the base being bigger than the top. But really, in our practice, we should be having some learning at the memory and, uh, mem remembering and understanding phases, but we really want to have more of our learning at the top of that, more activities that get into applying and creating and evaluating. And so that becomes important. And I thought this was a really good graphic for you to see that and be able to understand that. So when we think about Bloom's taxonomy and the revised taxonomy, again, this is just another way to think about it. We have, as you can look at some of the information on this about page 47, um, I tried to take the stages and put them on my ladder. So at the bottom, we have remembering and understanding. Towards the middle, we ask students to apply and analyze. Towards the top, we ask them to create and evaluate. And this is important when we think about assessment because often when we have true, false, fill in the blank, those tend to be at the remembering and understanding phases of learning and, under and, and uh, knowledge. When we have multiple choice questions, often we're able to get a little bit into the analyze and apply but when we get into evaluate and create, we can do some of that with open-ended um, essay questions. But often when we truly get into those higher level thinking skills, we're going to get into what we call authentic assessment. Excuse me, problem-based assessment, doing projects with our students. So in order to get to those higher levels, we have to make sure that we're going just beyond what is required. Now, your book is going to go in next to a description of how to come up with what we call a table of specifications. And basically what a table of specifications, and that's um, in the 50s of the pages if you're following along, what they do is they say to take your questions when you create an exam and plot out by the Bloom's level, where do they fall? And so you can look at, it, at, at your questions when you create an exam excuse me, and see really where the level of questioning is asked. What are you asking your students to do? And is that really what you want your students to be able to do? So whenever we create an assessment, there are a couple of issues that you need to understand. And one of those is validity. And when we talk about validity, we are looking at Validity determines the essential aspect of an instrument measuring what it is supposed to as well as the ability to make appropriate interpretations based on our data or evidence. And you noticed I put some of that in red. And that's because validity basically is saying, does this exam, does this little assessment that I'm giving you measure what I want it to measure? Secondly, a validity is always open to our appropriate interpretations. And that means if I use the results of an exam, even if it's a valid exam, for something it was not designed for, then my results and my interpretations become less valid. So let's talk a little bit about validity. So again, here's one of my graphics. When we think about validity, it is one idea. 
but there's three types of validity that goes into my validity. There's content related, criterion related, and construct related. So when we think about content validity, I want you to think about content of, in terms of content knowledge. So content validity says that is the, are our questions and is our assessment directly aligned with the content that we are trying to learn? So think about if we were studying about um, saber-tooth tiger times and I decided that I was going to teach you all about the different types of animals that lived during that time, the woolly mammoth and saber-tooth tigers. But if the book test that we were going to use for chapter five asked you all about the hunters and gatherers or how the hunters lived and what the what the habitat was in terms of what the people lived in and how they survived, I would not have good content validity. And so the first thing you need to know is to make sure that you're, you're assessing the content that's being taught. Secondly, we look at what's called criterion related validity. And this examines the relationship between our assessment and another performance. So often things like the SAT or the ACT are considered to be, have concurrent and what's called predictive validity. And so we look at the SAT or the ACT and that is supposed to predict your performance in a college setting. If you are in an elementary classroom, you might have heard of Dibbles. Well, Dibbles, the dynamic, dynamic indi indicators of basic early literacy in Dibbles Next, they have a predictive value. So when we look at those results, we say, if a student is emerging or if a student is at risk, that is predictive of their future performance without interventions. And that's related to a criterion or one part of knowledge. The third type is construct validity. And a construct is basically a concept, which is why I put it in my little cloud. So think about intelligence. It's not something you can hold or depression. It's a real thing, but again, it's not something that you can put out there. So when something is related to a construct, and it can be viewed in multiple ways, then we have to make sure that the test is aligned with that. So what I like is your book talks about gifted. The idea of gifted or high ability is a hypothetical construct. It's not something that we can reel. So we have to make sure that the tests are very well aligned, which basically means that often we as mere mortals are not going to be aligning many of our assessments to some of these especially construct related. So again, any validity of a measure, whether it's a checklist, a rubric, or a test, whether we create it or use it from a textbook, you have to make sure that it is aligned with the goals that you were teaching and that it's also reliable. And reliable is the partner to validity. So when we talk about it, we're not only gonna talk about validity, we're going to talk about reliability. And so what's reliability? Well, reliability is the ability to get the same results over time. You want your car to be reliable. You want to know when you go out and start your car to go to work, you want to know that it's going to start each time. You don't want it to start mm, two out of five times. You want it to start every day. And so when we think about reliability, what we should be able to do is get basically, statistically, the same results when we give the test. And we're gonna talk about how we do that. So when we think about reliability, I like to think about my bullseye. And I've given you an example here. We might have a couple of assessments, but even though I'm measuring something, I can measure it wrong. And so one example that I often use is my multiplication test for story problems. And I wanna know if you can do 
double digit multiplication. So I give you 50 story problems in 30 minutes. And I see if you can do my test. Well, guess what folks? You all failed. You must not know multiplication. Well, first we stop and say, was my test valid? Well, were there other factors that interfered with it? Yes, there were. Hopefully you've said the reading ability. What if I don't read well? What if I don't read quickly? What about the time factor? 50 word problems in 30 minutes? So could those have affected my validity? But I'm not thinking about that yet. So I think, well, maybe there's something wrong with my test. So I write another word problem test. And this time, I'm only going to give you 40 word story problems to do in 30 minutes. And I'm going to see if you know double digit multiplication. Well, guess what? You all failed it again. Well, my test must be reliable. I got the same results. Well, if a test isn't valid, our results can't be reliable. Or they can be reliably wrong. So we're going to talk about a couple of different types of reliability. The first one is stability retest and test retest. Basically, this is the understanding that if I were to give you one measure over another, over repeated administrations, you would get a similar or consistent score. So think about IQ tests. If you take one now and another five years you take another one, a retest, we would assume, based on all the data that we have, that that would be a reliable predictability. Your scores would be statistically the same. Okay, we want our coefficient to be between plus one and negative one. What you're probably more familiar with is the alternate form. And this is when we have two forms of a test, form A and form B. So often what we will see is that even when you take something like the core, you will have two different forms and half the questions are on one and they've aligned it with the other questions that are on form two. And that way, we not having to take the test, everybody gets the same test every time because that's gonna minimize testing. So that's gonna be another thing that we wanna look at. That we make sure if you are creating two assessments that you're asking the same types of questions, going back to that table of specifications, over each point. When we think about internal consistency, basically this says, if we were to take the assessment and we were to split it in half and do odds and evens, which is one of te fav teachers' favorite ways of doing an accommodation, they say, do the odds. Well, have you looked at it to see, will I get a fair sampling of all the problems if I only do the odds? The, uh, the, the odds. Or if I split it in half and do the first half, will I have the same quality of questions, the same level of questions than if I do the last half? And so when we look at that, we have to make sure if you're making that kind of accommodation for students, please, that you look. The other one that becomes very important for you as teacher candidates and for you as you go further in your career is inner rate reliability. And this is any two time, any time that two people are rating the same assignment. So if you were to give a project and I and Dr. Torlone were both grading your assignment or to make it more real to you, when you're in your practicum and your cooperating teacher and your university supervisor both observe you giving your lesson, you would hope we would have inner rate of reliability. We have to have gone through, there's a whole process. I used to do this with the state when we had um, teacher portfolios. We trained people on how to do this so that we understand what we're looking for. Do we have a good definition and a common definition of what an engaging classroom is? What it means to use the um, language of the discipline? so that we're using the same ideas so that we give you the same score statistically. So that's just when two people, you and your co-teacher, are grading an assignment, a project that your group is giving, are you using the same terms? Are your 
is there reliability in the scores that you give and your co-teacher gives? And if you want to look at a li that a little more in depth, you can look at page 61. So when we think about reliability and validity, which are two of the major terms that you will need to know, okay, just a little heads up there, that we always have to be careful that the assessments that we're giving are reliable and they're valid. And as teachers, we're human. We cannot do complicated reliability and validity studies, but we can do our best effort. And we can look at what we're doing in our practice to make sure that the assessments that we're giving are related to the content, they're related to what our students need to know and to what we've taught, and that there's an alignment. Hopefully, it's reliable and it's valid. Those are basically the big ideas for Chapter 3. If you have not taken your Module 1 assessment, please do so. Remember that you will have two opportunities to take that to score 80% or better. If you have any questions, give me a call, send me a text or an email, and we'll talk. Have a great day.